Okay, we're carrying on with uh, Second Peter. I introduced the, the book last week. I won't go back through all that, but as I explained, Peter's writing this letter uh, shortly before his execution, which is in Rome. And his execution is, is probably dated between A.D. 64 and 66, executed under uh, Emperor Nero. We have good uh, uh, post-biblical tradition for that. And so he's, he's right there in the mid-60s in Rome writing this. Now, he may well be sending this to the same group of Christians to whom he addressed First Peter. Uh, that's one good reading of that text where he alludes to uh, an earlier letter. But it's possible that the two groups aren't the same. It's possible that he's writing to the same group that he addressed in First Peter, but possible that he's not. And if he's not, then you say, well, okay, what can, we, what can we learn or piece together about uh, where is he writing this? And he's probably then, since the group he's writing to, they had, at, they had received at least one letter from the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul, he ministered and wrote in Asia Minor and Macedonia and Greece. That area was the focus of Paul's work. So then we can say, well, then probably uh, he's writing to somebody there. And then if that's true, then we can surmise that he's probably writing to a predominantly Gentile group. There are a couple of passages that make you think it's a Gentile group, but as I said last week, they can be skinned a different way, so it's not really that clear from, uh, from those different passages uh, in the letter itself that he's writing to Gentiles, but it seems reasonable that he's either writing to the Gentiles in Asia Minor that he wrote to in 1 Peter or he's writing to predominantly Gentiles in Asia Minor, Macedonia, or Greece. Now, whatever the confusion is there, his main purpose for writing is clear, and he's writing to combat certain false teachers who had arisen within the church and who were threatening the particular community to which he's writing. So this is another occasional letter, though I said last week it, it is traditionally classified as a Catholic or universal epistle meaning to the church at large, it really is uh, an occasional letter. It's written to a specific group of Christians who are being threatened by false teachers, and that's why he's writing it. And these false teachers were doctrinally and morally corrupt, both. They denied a future coming of Christ, and you see that in chapter 3, uh, and we'll get to that. But they said, no, Jesus isn't coming back. He's not coming back in judgment and they engaged in all manner of sins of the flesh, tied to that, no doubt, the denial of Christ's return in judgment, a consummating return. And then they lived immoral lives. Uh, Christ isn't coming to judge. That's all kind of a myth that's been foisted on you to control your behavior kind of thing. Pff, pay no attention to that. So they, lived, they, were, they were doctrinally and morally corrupt. And as you think about it, you know, there's an awful, awful lot of the letters in the New Testament that address uh, false teachers and that kind of thing. You see in Galatians, you see in Colossians, the Johannine epistles, uh, here, and I'd have to go through and see where else. But this is a significant thing and because it is dangerous. See, we don't, we don't think that way. We think, God, you know, it doesn't matter. Believe anything you want. Who cares? You just say the word Jesus and that's it. But that's not true. You see, there are things known as heresies. And heresies, can, they are damning. And that's part of why he's so concerned about what's going on here. Now, when we ended, we were looking at where we, we were looking here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. So you see, we didn't get too far. He's Simeon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ, to the ones who have received a faith of equal privilege to us through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has given to us everything for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and manifestation of divine might, through which things he has given to us the precious and very great promises, so that through them you might become sharers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption in the world, caused by lust. Now, there's an awful lot of stuff going on in here. You may say, why is this guy spending so long on four verses? It's just like, you know, there are times when you get into different texts, and they're like thickets. And, and, you know, it's like, what do these words mean? How do they connect? 
what is going on here? And so sometimes you have to go through, and I was, I was laughing. I'd spent, I don't know how long we were in First Peter, and we were here Sunday night. The young people were just going right through it, and I tapped Joseph. I said, see, I could have gone through First Peter in like a week. You know, and somebody else came up to me and said that, and they had that same idea. Why are you taking two months or four months or whatever it was? But here we see, it, it, in, we're, we're looking at this, and I pointed out last week that the recipients of this letter, they had received a faith. It is something that was given to them. They received it through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, what does that mean? They received a faith through the righteousness of God. And what I suggested to you is that they receive this faith through the preaching of the gospel, and that's through the righteousness of God, understood in the sense of righteousness of God being his saving work, his saving activity. And that is a frequent way that righteousness referring to God is understood. It is as his saving work. So it is in, his, in the preaching of the gospel, as Paul says in Romans 1.16, the righteousness of God is being revealed. It is taking place in history. It is happening. It is being uncovered. So I think that's what he means. So I see here that they receive this righteousness. They receive this faith through the righteousness of our God and Savior. It is through the preaching of the gospel. It is in the preaching of the gospel that God's saving activity His righteousness in that sense takes place. That's what I think is going on there. Now the faith they had received, I said last week, he he mentions that this is of equal privilege to that of any other Christian. See, their, their faith receives all the blessings that attach to the faith of anyone else. They are no less a child of God than any other Christian, than an apostle, anybody. And that's true of us. We as Christians are children of God. You see, we, ha- we, are, we have a faith that is of equal privilege because as Christians, we are children of God. And that's an important thing to understand and to see that, you know, your exalted status. Now, that's where I want to pick back up. Peter says in verse 2, he, in verse 2, he invokes blessings on those who have come to know God in Christ in their conversion to the Christian faith. He says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. They came to know God, to know Jesus in their conversion, to know him in that sense, to know him intimately, to have a relationship with him. And it is in Christ that, that uh, grace and peace are found. So he's praying that, you know, in their, in their uh, Christian faith, that the, that the mercy and the peace there, that, it be, that grace and peace be multiplied to them, it is only... As Christians, only as people who have come to and who have not renounced the knowledge of God in Christ, that these blessings, these blessings of, exist of God's grace and peace. So he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in your state of knowing God and Christ, in your converted state. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. And his prayer for grace and peace to be multiplied to them is made in light of how richly Christ or God the Father has already blessed Christians. Now, in your translation, you may have a a new verse or even a new paragraph begin in verse 3. There are a lot that do that. Uh, I opted to go with the American Standard, New American Standard, because verse 3 begins with a preposition, host, as. And so it just seems to me you just have to ignore it if you're going to start a new verse there. So I thought, you know, you take it and you tie it to verse 3 as the the American standard and new American standard do. And then you understand that as is seeing that. Okay, so he says, look, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in your converted state, seeing how God has blessed you already in Christ. The blessings he's already, so he says, given that God has bestowed great blessings on you already, I'm praying that he multiply things to you. So that's, the, that, that's how I see that, that working out. And those blessings include his providing by divine power everything needed for godly living, for righteous living. See, when he says here, seeing that his divine power has given to us everything for life and godliness, well, that life and godliness is, is probably what's called a hendiades, okay, where you have two nouns that are, that are linked by a conjunction to make one point instead of a noun with a qualifier. And an example that I ran across was, he came despite rain and weather instead of he came despite rainy weather. 
And it's simply a way of a stylistic way of adding force to the statement. So this life and godliness, I don't think is speaking of two discrete things. He is saying that he has given us everything for godly living. He has given us everything for moral living, for righteous living. As Christians, we have all we need for living a moral life, a life that respects God's will, which resources include the Holy Spirit's, His empowering our lives. As you see in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, Romans chapter 8, verses 12 and 13, and a lot of other places. You see, as I've said many times, conversion to Christ is not simply the same person in a new situation. It's a new person in a new situation. Christianity is not merely forensic. It is not simply that your state, you are now the same person, but you're now forgiven. There is a transformation. You are taken out of sinful living. You are renewed. As Paul says, we rise to what? Walk in newness of life. We are not the same person. That is not all. There is power in Christianity. There is power in converting to live in a different way. And this is what he's saying. Peter is saying, listen, his divine power has given us everything for godly living. He's given that to us. We receive this divine assistance for godly living in our conversion to Christ who called us to conversion by the glory and power that were manifested in his incarnation, his coming, his ministry, and his resurrection through his saving work. See, he called us through his saving work. We've received divine assistance for godly living through conversion to Christ who called us to conversion through his saving work. Now, I translated this where it says uh, glory and manifestation of divine might. I don't think it's terribly significant whether you take it. It, it very often is translated as glory and goodness or glory and excellence and glory and virtue. But this word that is used here, as Richard Balcom says, in this context, arete is virtually synonymous with doxa glory and denotes the manifestation of divine power. And when you look in the standard Greek lexicons, the use of this word here in this particular verse is included under the meaning manifestation of divine power. So that's how they saw it. So I think that makes sense where you're saying, listen, it is this, it is this power that is exhibited in the coming, the ministry, and the resurrection of Christ. It is in his saving work. That is this manifestation of power. And he called us to conversion by that. Through his saving work, through the glory and power that were manifested in his incarnation, ministry, and resurrection, he also what? He gave to us the precious and very great promises. Through his saving work, he gave to us the precious and very great promises. Now, Peter doesn't here specify the promises that he has in mind, but it seems pretty clear to me that he's referring to the magnificent promise of Christ's return to consummate the kingdom of God and the promise of resurrection life in a perfect reality, the new heavens and new earth, that's associated with that return. You say, well, why do you think those are the promises he's referring to? Well, the word promises, there's this verbal link. He's going to refer to promises in chapter 3. Okay, his statement in chapter 3, verse 4, about the false teachers denying what? The promise of Christ's coming. His statement in chapter 3, verse 9, that the Lord is not slow to fulfill that promise of Christ's coming when viewed from God's perspective. And his reference in chapter 3, verse 13, to the promise of the new heavens and new earth. So we have this promise of his coming, this promise of the new heavens and new earth, both of which are precious and very great. But on top of that, the word that he uses in chapter 1, verse 4 for promises, epangelma, it's a plural form there in chapter 1, verse 4. It occurs one other time in the entire Bible in 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 13, where he says the promise of the new heavens and new earth. So he, to me, it's clear he's signaling over here through this verbal link of promise, the promises that he's going to describe. And that the promises he has in mind relate to the eschaton, the end, the final state, this eternal state. That fits very nicely with this statement that it's through these promises, meaning through their fulfillment, that they might become sharers of the divine nature. Now that's an odd phrase. I hope when you read it you go, hmm, that's a, that's a curious phrase. 
What I think he's talking about is that they, and of course we, they will become sharers of the divine nature in the sense that in the resurrection, in the resurrection, they will resemble God in additional aspects of his being. They and we will resemble in resurrection life, we will resemble God in additional aspects of his being. When this reality is heavenized, when this reality gets the ultimate makeover in conjunction with Christ's return, God who is inherently immortal, right? he is inherently immortal, he is immortal by nature, the God who is inherently immortal and incorruptible, he will then bestow immortality and incorruptibility on them and on us. So see, we will share in God's nature in that we will at that time participate in additional aspects of his nature. Immortality and incorruptibility. He will then bestow those, those qualities that are inherently his. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 54, this perishable mortal body will at that time by God's grace, what will it be? It will be made imperishable and immortal. And in addition, at that time in resurrection life, our sanctification, our transformation toward Christ's likeness will be complete. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, he says, when Christ appears, we shall be like him. You see, our transformation will include our being morally perfected. So when he's talking about this, he says, he's given us a precious and very great promises so that through the fulfillment of those promises, you might become sharers of the divine nature in that you will participate in the divine nature in these additional aspects. Immortality, incorruptibility, and being morally perfected. So he's talking about that, I think, because of the verbal link of promises. He's talking about it because I see that it fits, it fits very nicely here with this idea, where he, this very nicely where he sits here and says that, listen, that uh, through these promises, they might become sharers of the divine nature. Peter's not the, this isn't a, an alien or foreign concept for Peter. I mean, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, that God had given them a new birth into a living hope, and then in verses 4 and 5, he spelled out the substance of that hope, and he said there that it, it's an inheritance that is what? Imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, that is the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So these aren't strange concepts to him. As Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 20 to 23, the present material world, subhuman creation, the present material world is under a curse of of corruption as the divine judgment on sin. See, that strikes me. You know, I told you many years ago, I was teaching a class, decades probably now, but I was teaching a class in the uh, White Station Church in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, teaching college kids or maybe high school kids, I don't remember. But I was, I was trying to tell them these ideas. I was like, what? Never heard this. I said, no, you know, see, this is, this is the big picture. This is the big picture. You see, you have creation itself has been subjected to corruption and decay as judgment on sin. And Peter says that in their participating in the divine nature, through the bestowal of resurrection life, they will in the fullest and most complete sense, in the fullest sense, we share in this something now, but they will at that time, in the fullest and most complete sense, they will have escaped from the corruption that is in the world caused by lust. How is there corruption in the world? Well, look at Romans. This world is cursed. It's decayed. It's spoiled. It is, it is subject. It is in slavery to decay and corruption. And we will at that time have escaped from the corruption that is in the world caused by lust. In other words, on that day... They will and we will have finally and fully escaped from the decay, the transitoriness, and the mortality that characterized the world as a result of sin that flowed from unbridled desire. The sin that flowed from lust. What has happened as a result of this? This world is fallen. And we are here in it. But a day is coming when because of Christ we will escape from that. We will participate in the divine nature in aspects in addition to the way we share in that now in that we will, he will bestow on us 
from his inherent immortality and incorruptibility, he will give that to us and we will be morally perfected. And this world is condemned because of lust, because of the sin that flowed from unbridled desire. Now that Peter's focus is on the eschaton, when he's talking about these promises, the eternal state is further suggested in verses 5 through 11. The very next section, he ties to the preceding, we're going to see that in a minute, he ties it to the preceding by the opening, he says, for this very reason, so he's given us here in these four, and then in 5 through 11 he says, for this very reason, and then he gives them exhortations, and the goal of the exhortation that he gives them is in the concluding verse of that section where he says, it is to be entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is exhorting them there so that they will manifest their faith to stay on the road. Why? That way you'll receive this rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So again, I see him now. What is he talking about? He's focusing on the eschaton. He's focusing on that. And also the denial of Christ's consummating coming where he comes and there's this judgment and there's this ultimate transformation that he's going to talk about in chapter 3. The denial of the consummated, consummating coming by the false teachers, that's central to the letters. That's the whole reason he's writing. Is that you have people who are denying that. They say that's not going to happen. Things go on now as they always have. This world is the way it's always been. Don't listen to these people who are telling you that there's going to be this radical transformation. There's going to be this consummating coming of Christ. Don't listen to them. Things just go on the way they always have. So that's the very purpose he's writing the letter. So it shouldn't surprise us that he addresses it early. And he's going to be all over it, by the way. Now Christ gave the promise of his return and the promise of the new heavens and new earth that he specifies in chapter 3, he gave this promise of his consummating return, the promise of the new heavens and new earth that are associated with that return, he gave those promises through his saving work, through the glory and power that are manifested in his incarnation, ministry, and resurrection. You say, well, how does he, how did, what do you mean he gave the promises through his saving work. He did that in the sense that his saving work provided for the fulfillment or the realization of the promises. Okay, here's what Moose says about it. He says, Peter's language here is elliptical in saying through these he has given us his very great and precious promises. He really means that through these attributes, and he's taking it as, as goodness and virtue or goodness and excellence, talking about the same thing though. He means that through these attributes, Christ has provided for the fulfillment of these promises. Okay, so that's what I think he's talking about here. He says that through these things, through his saving work, he has provided these great and very precious promises of his consummating return and the new heavens and new earth that are associated with that return. He did it through his saving work because his saving work provided for the fulfillment or the realization of those promises. As Paul says, I've... I've had an opportunity to go over this a number of times, but as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 to 10, God's will for the management of the end of history, for the conclusion of the ages, is that heaven and earth will be what? United. Heaven and earth will be united in Christ. You see, they're going to be united in Christ. That's why I use the phrase heavenized. This creation will be made heavenly. All aspects of sin, all the consequences of sin will have been expunged. And so, unified, heaven and earth, united in Christ, as he says in Ephesians chapter 1. See, Christ's redemptive work is the basis on which creation will be transformed. He's that big. You know, Paul says in, in Colossians chapter 1 verse 20, that it's through Christ that God will reconcile, reconciles to himself all things. All things. He is the peacemaker. He is the one who brings all things into harmony. Christ is the basis on which this is going to happen. He's going to unite heaven and earth in Christ. He's that large. He's that wonderful. He's everything. Okay, he says in verse 5. five verse, chapter 1, verse 5 to 11. And also for this very reason, making every effort... 
supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with perseverance and perseverance with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these things are existing in you and increasing, they make you neither useless nor unfruitful in the, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the man in whom these things are not present is blind by being nearsighted, having forgotten the cleansing of his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be more diligent to make your calling and election sure, for by doing these things you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be richly provided to you. Okay, Peter sits here and he he says in in chapter 5, or or it starts off here, in in chapter 1 verse 3, he prays for grace and peace to be multiplied to them, seeing how God has blessed them so richly already, as he expresses in verses 3 and 4. Okay, grace and peace be multiplied, seeing how God has blessed you so richly already in verses 3 and 4. And then verses 5 and 7, they are based on the description of those blessings that he has just mentioned in verses 3 and 4. Because he says, for this very reason, the very reason I've just mentioned about the blessings that you have in Christ, because Christ has given us everything necessary for godly living, and because he's given us the precious and very great promises, we must work to be the people that God wants us to be, to be morally and ethically pure. We cannot to continue to live like the world from which we've been saved. We have to work to be the people that God wants us to be. We don't like hearing that. Oh, no, no, yeah, so you're a legalist. You're hung up on doing. I'm trying to understand the Bible. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to do. And I'm telling you what I think he's saying. He says, listen, make every effort. That sounds like work to me. He says, make every effort to be the kind of people that God wants us to be. Now note, so he he requires effort on our part. You say, well, I thought, look, I thought it's all about the Spirit. It is about the Spirit. The Spirit transforms us. He produces Various qualities in our lives, right? I mean, the classic list of Galatians 5, 22 and 23, fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He does these things. The Spirit is the one who's producing them, but He doesn't do so apart from our laboring to develop them. You say, how does that work? Well, it's through applying ourselves that we yield to His molding. We make ourselves a hospitable environment for the growth of his fruit. He will allow us to resist him. He will allow us to say, no, I'm not going to do it. He is trying to transform us. We are on the anvil. He's trying to, I want you to be this way. And we can fight it. Or we can go with it, we can labor at it, and then become this hospitable environment where the Spirit produces within us Christ-likeness. So these things aren't separated. These things aren't separated, but he clearly is saying to them that they need to labor. They need to make every effort to do this. Now, in this this list of virtues, let me say to you that it's it's unlikely that he's indicating that there's any particular order of development, despite how it looks, okay? I know how it looks. But I think it's unlikely that he's indicating there's a particular order of development as though each virtue builds on the preceding one and you do this in a certain order. I think what Peter is doing here, he's probably using a conventional literary form called a sorites. And this literary form is A, B, B, C, C, D, and so on. So it's a, it's a known, understood form that was used. And he's probably using this literary form to provide a memorable summary of the kind of qualities that should characterize a Christian's life. So don't get hung up on, is it here and then from this one, from this one. from this. Just see that this is a way, this is a reflection of the kinds of qualities that should characterize a Christian's life. He tells us, listen, make every effort to have these things in your life. Here's what Moo says on that. Douglas Moo, uh, he, this is from his commentary on Second Peter and Jude. 
He says, some commentators and especially popular writers and speakers make much of the sequence of the steps here as if we must make sure to add these virtues exactly in the order that Peter sets them forth. But this reading of the passage, while superficially convincing, fails to take account of the literary form Peter is using. That's the Sorites that I mentioned. Once we see that Peter is using a popular device of his day, we'll recognize also that the order in which he puts these virtues may be somewhat haphazard. All of them are important, but we doubt that Peter intends to say that we must pursue them in the precise order he gives them. Okay, I think it's just, it's a way of holding on to the idea that these are to be the kinds of qualities and characteristics that we are to have in our lives as Christians. Now, the only two fixed items are those that regularly appeared during Christian adaptation of this literary form was the first one, faith, and the last one, love. They seem to hold those two positions when Christians use this form. Now, there may be significance to that, right? Faith is the basis of our relationship with God, the basis of everything. And love is the summary of our relationship with God and with one another. So maybe there's this special significance in the order of those two things being attached there. But uh, that's about as far as I would go with that. But here we have the Spirit of God through Peter telling these Christians, these people of faith, that they are to labor to have lives. So he speaks to us. The Spirit of God, through Peter, first to his audience, to us today. He says we are to labor to have lives of virtue or goodness. And this is a very general quality of moral excellence. Okay, we might put it as doing the right thing or acting in our particular situations and circumstances as Christ would act. Okay, it's a general thing, but it's still something that we are to labor to have. Okay, we are to labor to have lives of virtue. We need to be working to be a Christ-like boss, a Christ-like employee, a Christ-like customer. A Christ-like friend, a Christ-like neighbor, a Christ-like student, a Christ-like parent, a Christ-like child, a Christ-like spouse. We are to take seriously. It's not, it's not you know, well, oh no, I, I go to Mesa and I kind of hang out there. and all. We are Christians. <laughs> so we are to, see, we're to labor to be this way, to, to have this quality, this attribute in our life of, of virtue, this Christ-likeness. Then he says we're to labor he tells people of faith we're to labor to have lives of knowledge. And I think as Richard Balcom says, this means the wisdom and discernment which a Christian needs for a virtuous life and which is progressively acquired. Wisdom and discernment that a Christian needs for a virtuous life. See, the virtuous person has to have wisdom and discernment, has to have his eyes open to traps, pitfalls, ways where it is easy to fall into compromise. It takes wisdom and discernment to do that. And we get that from absorbing God's perspective on reality. We get that from drinking in the Word of God in our interactions with one another, in our study, in our coming to classes like this. We are trying to more and more stand and align ourselves with the way God sees things. And that will give us that wisdom and that discernment that will help us in living a virtuous life. He says that we are to labor to have lives of self-control. We have to work to be masters of our own desires. You know, there's still a war raging until the consummation, until we are morally perfected. There's a battle that goes on. We are tempted. We are pulled. We have to be people who have self-control, have self-discipline. This term was often, but not exclusively, it was associated with sexual restraint which certainly fits with the false teachers here. And it certainly fits in our society, right? Do we look at people who are able to restrain themselves, young men and young women, who are able to restrain themselves sexually, and do we see that as virtuous? Culturally speaking, do we see it as, no, 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 you're hung up. You see? You're hung up. No, no, you see, if you're, you're a virgin, if you're a virgin as a young man, not married... Will you stand up and say that? Why? You know, I, I don't want people to think. I want people to think I'm a player. Right? Why? That's how it is, you see. And so this idea, this restraint, self-control is a virtue. 
It is a virtue and it is something that ought to be recognized as a virtue. And this is what he's saying to these Christians. He says, listen, self-control. We're to exercise self-discipline and restraint. We are not to excuse our lack of it for the host of reasons our society gives. Well, don't, don't worry about that. You don't have to be, well, you don't have to be restrained. Well, I, I, I'm sure your dad was rough on you. Or whatever else our society develops, you see. All of which is to what? It is to undercut this notion that I am to be self-restrained and self-controlled. We are to be that way, Christians. The Spirit of God tells us we are to labor to have lives of self-control. That does not mean that we are hung up. It means that we're trying to glorify God. He says that we're to labor to have lives of perseverance. And you can translate this endurance or steadfastness. And as Balcom says, this refers to courageous and steadfast endurance in the face of suffering or evil. Courageous and steadfast endurance in the face of suffering or evil. See, we are called to nobly cope with the difficulties and the injustices of life. To refuse to be emotionally and spiritually defeated by them because we trust in God and we hope for the fulfillment of His promises. So you sit there and say, listen... I'm in a storm. I'm not being treated fairly. This is horrible. Why is this happening to me? And I would say, yes, 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 yes. But you hold on. Because you serve a God who has promised that the day is coming. The day is coming when everything is going to be put right. You just hold on, Christian. You hold on through all. I know injustice, I see it. I know it. But you just hang on to me. And the day's coming. And that, see, there is power in Christian faith for living. There's power for living. You see, because it's not simply, I'm not simply this rat in this maze that popped up for no reason. I am living a life that is being taken somewhere, that is being controlled by the sovereign God who has promised that the day is coming when there will be no death, no mourning, no crying, no tears. And he's bringing it, and you and I sit here and say, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, because we're ready for that day. He says that they're to labor to have lives of godliness. Now, this is a general term that denotes respect for God's will and moral living, which are an inseparable aspect of a proper attitude toward God. Peter said in chapter 1, verse 3, that God gave them everything necessary for godly living, and then here he commands them to exert themselves in making use of those resources. He has given us the power to live righteous lives, godly lives, holy lives. You mean you're sinful? How many times do I have to say that? No, I'm not. But does it mean something to say? Can we say somebody lives a righteous life? Aren't there people in the Bible who live righteous lives? Not perfectly, I understand, but then there must be a different use of the term. Right? Everybody sinned, but we still speak. It wasn't Job righteous. Oh, I think I read that somewhere. All right, so there is a way that people say, what does that mean? You think you're, no, I, I'm, I'm sinful, but there is a difference. And Christians are to be different people. We are to be different people. This is to be reflected. We are to live lives of godliness. We are to take advantage of the power that God has given to us. Here's what Moose says. He says, while God gives us the ability to become godly, it is our responsibility to use the power he has made available to us and actually work at becoming people who please God in every phase of life. What the Spirit of God says to the body of Christ, make every effort to be godly. Okay, is that legalism? <laughs> or is that Bible? We are called to live holy, righteous lives. And he says that. And he's empowered us. Got you. He empowered us to do it. Right? We're not the same people in a new situation. New people in a new situation. Reborn. Empowered. Put on a different plane. Regenerated. And we're to live that way. We are to use what he's given us to his glory. He says that we are to live lives... I know that bell's going to ring. We're to live lives that are characterized by brotherly love or brotherly kindness. And this refers to the love, the bond that naturally exists among siblings. I know it doesn't always exist. 
It ideally exists. It naturally exists among brothers and sisters. In the early church, this was applied to spiritual siblings, to brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we're commanded to have toward fellow believers the kind of commitment, the kind of devotion, to, sacrificial devotion to their welfare that one has of one's physical brother and sister. And you think, would that change the church? Would the church be affected if I could snap my fingers and have everybody in here to be sacrificially committed to the welfare of one another? My guess is it would. <laughs> I think it would. But he's commanding us to do that, and then he's going to go and use a little larger term where he's going to talk about agape next. Uh, next week, Lord willing, thank you for coming. <laughs>